All right, what's the idea? Just a minute, Sonny. Just a minute? What do you want? Well, Sonny, I want to talk to you about Miss Sylvianne. Miss Sylvianne is none of your business. Now, you stay away from her. I guess I am hurt a little bit. Well, come on inside. I'll fix that cut for you. All right. Oh. Arnica. That's bottled fire, you mean. You'll give our place a bad reputation. What were you fighting about? I still don't know. I was walking over to the palace when this big buffalo jumped me. Stay away from Miss Sylviane, he said. A fat chance there is of that happening. Little Joe, how many times do I have to tell you? I'm not your sort of girl. And just what sort of a girl are you? Well, I... I'm no Juliet. You've got the whole town talking about you, my boy. Yeah, what do you mean? That fight, my boy. I... Sylvia Ann, where are the drinks? Pop, isn't it a little early for that? No, no, not for me. No, sir, not, not for me. Oh, uh, Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Brock. Oh, Mr. Brock. I heard a lot about you. You own most of the mining claims around here, don't you? I've heard about you. Higgler's a real hard case and a troublemaker. I had to fire him from one of my mines. Everyone was surprised the way you handled him. I was a little surprised myself. You made an impression on this town, a big one. Now, how will you have a small libation? Just a small libation. Mr. Mayor, you know, I think Mr. Cartwright might be the man to help you. You know what I'm oh, oh, yes, yes, indeed. The very man. And I help you do what? Oh, please, sit down. You see, our sheriff, he had an accident. He broke his leg. We had to take him to Reno, and he'll be gone for a couple of weeks. Now, what this town needs is someone to wear his badge till he gets back. Mr. Cartwright, we think you're just the man. You want me to wear a sheriff's badge? But you can handle yourself. You proved that today. That's what the job needs. Isn't that right, Mayor? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. You look at it from the viewpoint uh, of the people who live here. Now, who are we going to pin that badge on? Some, some grocery clerk? No. Yeah, now, wait, wait a minute. Now, don't you think this is an awful lot of responsibility just to, to hand to someone as young as myself? You know what we mean, don't you, Sylviane? It's a matter of, um, of civic responsibility. Well, I have to admit it, it does make sense. Never argue with a woman, Mr. Cartwright. It's awfully hard to argue with a woman like Sylviane. Well, Sylvia? If it's for the good of the town, I'm, I'm on their side. This job's getting tougher to turn down every minute. Then why turn it down? There's something I have to do first. Then you're saying you're going to take the job? I'm saying I'll think about it. Oh, that's good enough. Capital, capital. Now, I think we should have a little drink on that. I hope you'll see it our way. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'll let you know by tomorrow morning. I'll see you later. I'll be here. Don't you think I can handle responsibility? Uh, Joe, I'm talking about a particular kind of responsibility. The responsibility that every man wears who 
pins on a badge and works and sometimes dies, making the law stand for what it does. But, Pa, I understand that, but no one, not even this, this kind of sheriff you're talking about, knows how he's going to work out until he's given the chance. But why a sheriff, Joe? Why? I didn't raise my sons to live by a gun. We all worked hard to make the Ponderosa what it is. I'd always thought that we'd all be content and happy to share in its future. Pa, oh, it's not that. I'm, I'm not deserting the Ponderosa. All I want is a chance to see if I can handle a job when it's given to me off the Ponderosa as well as on. Pa, it's only for a few weeks. Besides, what, what could happen in a little town like Rubicon? It only takes one man to break the law. Son. I wouldn't be honest with you. If I didn't tell you that I don't like this idea. Now, perhaps... Well, maybe it'd be better if you tell him to find someone else. You mean find someone that's older, don't you, Pa? Someone who's not the baby of the family, someone who's a grown-up man like Hoss or Adam. Well, I'm tired of being little Joe, Pa. I'm tired of being the little brother. I want a chance to do something by myself. Joseph, I never treated you as a baby. I'm sorry, Pa. It's not you. But it is Hoss and it is Adam. They don't pay any attention to anything I do. Everything I try to do is a big joke to them. Well, I... I think I can understand how you feel, son. But do you really think that pinning on a sheriff's badge is going to solve that problem? Joey, well, we got all that wood loaded without you. Hey, you're back from Rubicon when the work's all finished. That's pretty good timing. That's enough fooling around, boys. Little Joe here has a serious decision to make, and I think we all ought to hear it. Well, tell me he's going to marry that little gal over in Rubicon. Which one? Aren't there several? <clears throat> Joe's been offered a job. What kind of job, little Joe? Being the sheriff of Rubicon. Sheriff? What's everybody in Rubicon, gals or something? <laughs> <laughs> At least you can see now why I have to take the job. <laughs> sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> you just forced him into making a decision that I didn't want him to make. Well, you mean he really wants to be a sheriff? Yes, I'm afraid he does. Oh, Paul. Little Joe's just... Little Joe. He's just a kid. Is he, Adam? Or is it that you've been thinking of him for so long as being just a little brother and that you've forgotten that he's growing up? That he has grown-up feelings and grown-up pride? If he's really serious about this, we ought to get into Rubicon. He's going to get him some trouble he can't handle. No, us. that's just the point. Little Joe's got to learn to handle his own troubles. I only wish he'd hadn't picked such a hard way to start. Well, I hope he remembers. Remembers what? That he has a family. That we love him. And we'd help him if he needs help. Mr. Mayo, what is it? He's here. That Cartwright kid. You mean little Joe? Then he went for it, didn't he? Yes, he went for it. He must sure think a lot of your daughter, Mr. Mayo. I hope she thinks you're worth all this. I'll be glad when the whole thing is over. Come on, you old sot. Fortify yourself with some courage to swear in our new sheriff. Those men you sent for, when will they get here? All in good time, Mr. Mayor. All in good time. And I further swear that I will enforce the laws of this town and my country. 
To the very best of my ability, so help me God. To the very best of my ability, so help me God. Congratulations and, and thanks, Sheriff. Well, Mayor? Oh, yes, congratulations. Is that all there is to it? It's a simple act, Cartwright. All it takes is a good man. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, the city uh, charter. The law requires the sheriff to read it. I guess I better learn the laws I'm supposed to enforce. Now don't go expecting too much excitement in our little town, Sheriff. And if you get tired of reading, you know what a royal palace is. Good luck. Thank you, Mayor. Ab, I'm not sure about that kid. He seemed pretty serious about this thing. You worry too much, George. Well, I have reason to. And the, uh, the others. Time's getting close and they're not even here yet. Yes, they are, George. Yes, they are. at the end of the hall. Who are the two undertakers? I don't know. Just some strangers. So, you decided to take the job. That's right. That's getting to see you the hard way, isn't it? <laughs> Is that the only reason you took the job? No, it's, it's not the only reason. But I think you're a pretty good one. Oh, uh, reminds me, I, I wrote something down for you. Well, what's the matter? Don't you like it? The city charter of Rubicon? Oh, oh, no, I, I gave you the wrong paper. Oh, yeah. soft what light through yonder window breaks it is the east and juliet is the sun arise fair sun and kill the envious moon who is already sick and pale with grief that thou her maid art far more fair than she it's beautiful hey, you know what it's from romeo and juliet of course i'm uh, i'm not exactly romeo Hey, what's going on here? The duties of the job aren't too demanding, are they, Sheriff? Now, to be quite frank with you, I'm not exactly sure what my duties are yet. Well, don't let me chase you away. Fred, let me have a cup of coffee, will you, please? I guess it is about time I show the citizens of Rubicon what their new sheriff looks like. I'll see you later. Bye-bye, Jim. Why are you doing this? Oh, honey, why worry about it? Why did you have Sheriff Cleaver sent out of town? Because he's a hard-nosed old man with 35 years' experience, wearing a badge and using a gun. And little Joe? Just a romantic kid. With no experience. That's right. Even if he blunders into my plan, he'll hesitate at that crucial second. By the time he figures out what to do, it'll be too late. Will you please tell me what's going to happen and when? How long has it been, Sylvia, since we first met? Five years, three months, and two days. And you've been patient, honey. And now we almost have it. Ab, I would have married you five years ago without a cent. I know, but marriage without money is no good. Now we can have both. Just a few days, we'll be we'll be on our way with the whole world in front of us. But I don't want the whole world. I just want you.
How about yesterday? No hard feelings. Get lost, Sheriff. And now, look, I'm only trying to be friendly. Now, you look. Don't you try to play Sheriff with me, sonny boy. You run along home and play with your toys. Wait a minute. I just try... Why don't you just give up, sonny boy? going anywhere just yet. Don't make me use it. Take your gun out nice and easy and throw it in front of you. All right, I'm taking you in. Now, what's wrong? You sore because you got a little bit of your own medicine? No, I've been beat up before. I just want to find out why you didn't nail me the first time. What's the charge? A starter assaulting an officer of the law. Over by the cell. Get inside. You can't keep me here. I can and I will. He answer some questions. Like what? Like who hired you to lose that fight? Well, I can't answer a question like that. You're gonna have to if you want to get out of that cell. You know, I never met the man I couldn't whip. With these. But they're no good against bullets. Give me the answers I want, and I'll make sure you get safely out of town. Who's the man that hired you? <laughs> you don't expect me to answer that. The man you're afraid of won't know whether you did or not. I could be able to take any chances with you behind bars. They know I won't talk. Yeah, sure they will. For a day or two. What's going to happen then? They're not going to be able to take any chances. They're going to come for you, Higgler. You don't have much choice. I got one choice here, boy. You're going to have to beat it out of me. If you think you can. <laughs> Joe, I heard about it. Oh, look at your face. All right, never mind that. Let's talk. Uh, yesterday I was a big man. I whipped the town bully and didn't even mess my hair. Today I couldn't have whipped Higgler with one hand tied behind his back. 
Now, you know what that means? No, I don't. It means this whole thing was a setup and I walked into it like a fool kid. Oh, Joe, don't say that. Why not? It's the truth, isn't it? And you're in on it too, aren't you, Silly Ann? Why aren't you? No. Joe, believe me, I don't know anything about this. You and Brock talked me into taking this job. They couldn't even wait a day or two, could they? Joe, maybe you shouldn't have taken this job. All right, move on. The excitement's over. Now, what do you know about this? What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I just don't want you to get caught in it. An hour ago, you were tickled pink I took this job. All right, I changed my mind. Now, take off that tin badge and quit trying to play grown-up. You're just a kid. Can't you understand that? There are some things you just can't do. Thanks. Now you sound like my family. Then go home, Joe, where you belong. Whatever is wrong here is not your concern. This badge makes it my concern. This town gave me a job. I'm going to finish it. And what'll you do the next time you run into another Higgler? Read him some poetry? Something out of Romeo and Juliet? You're just stupid. Is that head of yours filled with muscle? Why don't you stay out of town like I told you? I was getting out of town, Mr. Brock. I just stopped for one drink. The one drink. And you ended up in the sheriff's jail. What did you tell him? I didn't tell him anything. I swear it, Mr. Brock. I don't like this, Ab. I don't like it at all. You said it'd be simple. Now it's getting complicated. Just shut up! Now, you just get him out of town. And you put him on the road. You mean under the road, don't you? No, you let him go. I don't want any more, as my friend the mayor puts it. Complications. Now, you just get up here. Nothing, my dear. You leave it be. Leave it be? How can I? I just saw Hitler with one of those strangers. Pop, how'd he get out of jail? No, I told you before. Leave it alone. The less you know, the better off you'll be. All right. If you won't tell me, I'll go ask Ab. No, no. Please don't do that. I don't want you involved in any of this. Aren't you my father? Aren't I already involved? Looking for something, Mayor? Oh, uh, Sheriff. I, just in time for a little drink. No, no, thanks. No drink. I just have some questions that need answers. Answers? Answers? <laughs> They're all in the city charter, my boy. No, not these answers, Mayor. I didn't bother to write these down. But I think you could give me a few. <clears throat> well, let's not just stand here like ordinary citizens. After all, we're city officials. Uh, let's go over there in the alcove and have a little talk. Mm -hmm. That's just what I want to have, Mayor. A little talk. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, can't you see that I'm busy with my associate from San Francisco? I understand, Mr. Brock. A gentleman never keeps a lady waiting. All right, but I want to go over our business arrangements again. I'll be just down the hall, Mr. Brock. All right, what is it that can't wait? Ab, what's going on? Who are these men? What do they want here? I haven't got time to answer a lot of silly questions. Well, Joe Cartwright is asking me questions, and they're questions I can't answer. He wants to know about Higgler and about how he got to be sheriff. What'd you tell him? What could I tell him? I don't know. That's right. And what you don't know, you don't worry about. But Joe's right. You did set Higgler up for him, didn't you? I just saw him now in the lobby with one of those... Those undertakers. All I did was send him out of town. You really enjoy looking for trouble, don't you? Tomorrow, everything out there can belong to me. But there's one man who can ruin it. 
He's coming to Rubicon tomorrow on the stage. Is that the man that's going to buy the options on your mining claims? He knows me from somewhere else. Under a different name and a different reputation. Ab, I don't know what you're talking about. The minute he steps off that stage, there's going to be an accident. Why? Because he can blow my scheme sky high the minute he sees me. I don't even know he was with that mining syndicate till they telegraphed me. He's got to die. But that's murder. Of course it's murder. Men murder other men every day in the week for small, petty reasons. Well, this is going to be for a big reason. For us and our future. But I don't want it that way. I won't let you do it. What are you going to do? Go to the authorities? To your father, the mayor, or maybe to our new young sheriff? Listen, he may be young, but he believes in that badge. Well, he lifts one little finger. He's going to be our young but dead sheriff. No, Ab, please. Sylvie, Ann, you've waited five long years, same as me. But I don't want it like this. Not this way. Well, what do you want? You want that cheap bar downstairs? You want to be stuck in this town the rest of your life? Now, listen to me. It is all arranged and paid for. No connection with me at all. It's going to look like a robbery attempt on that stage that failed. Oh, that's why you sent for those two men. I knew it. I smell death on them. Everywhere they go, they reek of it. That's right. That's their job. Honey, I thought you loved me. I do love you. Then trust me, Sylvianne. You won't regret it. And what about little Joe? He's only a boy, Ab. Well, you just keep him occupied till after that stage comes in. Nothing's going to happen to him. That's several hours. Yeah, I guess it is. Ab, please tell me you love me. You know I love you. Don't you ever forget it. Sylvia, and he didn't tell me anything. Oh, he escapes pretty fast in that bottle. So that leaves you. Yes, I guess it does. Do you want to ask me any more questions? For a starter, where's Brock? I guess I know where he is. Joe, wait. Where he went? Where is he? Little Joe, I've got to talk to you. Oh, that's very funny. All of a sudden, you have to talk to me, huh? Look, what I said before to you, I, I was angry. And anger, truth will out. I read that somewhere. Not in Romeo and Juliet. I tried to tell you I was no Juliet. All right, we've been through this all before, haven't we? All I want now are some answers. You're Brock's girl, right? You've always been his girl. You had to find that out someday. And that's why you went along with this... this cheap trick of making me the sheriff. Why you got me to pin this badge on her. Yes. Because my man asked me to. And because I would do anything that my man asked me to do. With one exception, little Joe. Murder. So that's it, huh? All right, when is it gonna be? Tomorrow. Sun up. On the stage. They're going to try to kill one of the passengers. I don't know who. The two undertakers we saw. Brock hired them, too, didn't he? Yes. Two against one. He likes a sure thing. Now you want me to stop it, is that it? I wish you could. But pinning on a badge and strapping on a gun will never make a gunfighter out of you. Yeah, so that's the real reason for giving me the job, huh? Yeah. Yeah, they wanted a boy for a sheriff, not a man. But you are a man, Joe, a very good man. But you can't do it alone. Yeah, I think my family might agree with you. I don't know the real reason why I took this job. Oh, granted, you were... You were part of it. The real reason was... 
The first time in my life somebody outside the family offered me a job with with responsibility. It's a chance to prove myself to my father and my brothers. <laughs> and look at me now. Wait a minute. Your father and your brothers. With their help, there'd be enough of you to stop this whole thing. Well, Joe, you can't do anything about it all by yourself. I can try. You wouldn't stand a chance. That's the way it was planned, wasn't it? Oh, don't you worry, Sylvianne. The stage comes in tomorrow, I'll be there and meet it. Joe, wait. You do understand, don't you? I mean, about Brock and me. No, I, I don't understand. Not you and Brock. Not a girl like you. this time of night like you told me what you don't know won't hurt you it's too late to worry about me now pop She wouldn't tell me where she was going. Now I'm asking you to get up and find her. She's a big girl, Mayor. I'm sure she's been on alone at night before. You mean to tell me you're going to lie there and do nothing? Look, I'm the sheriff here, not her father. I should have known better than to swear in a boy for a sheriff. Somebody stole your horse. Well, no, no, no. I, I didn't say they stole my horse. I, I just said it disappeared out of the barn. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Sheriff. Maybe the mayor. Hey, look, and I... Mr. Mr. Brock, uh, that, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, Mr. Brock, Ab about my being sheriff. What do you want to talk about? Well, see, in in the beginning, the whole idea about being sheriff and everything. Well, see, that all appealed to me. I, I don't know. I, well, I think I'm too young or something. I, I think it's too big a job for me. All right, we're satisfied with the job you're doing. You're doing just fine. Isn't that right, Mayor? You sure? Fine. Hey, but, but am I really, Mr. Brock? Now, now look. F -f First thing, I, I arrest that bully Higgler. And then I lose him. Now, earlier this evening, I'm talking to Sylvie Ann. Now she's disappeared. And then to top it all off, I, I can't even find my horse. Well, it's just that you kind of knew with the job. You haven't had much experience sheriffing, but... Uh... You'll get better as you go on. Yeah, I just don't think so. Sure you will. There's only uh, one thing, though. What, what's that? 
Well, it's Sylvie Ann. I, um, I think you should go look for her. Yeah, but how can I? I don't even know where she went. Well, the, um, the mayor's kind of worried about her. Would you look for a sheriff? Without a horse? Listen, Carrad, I have no delivery stable here, and it's just full of horses. If they haven't all been stolen by now, you can have your pick. Hey, thanks, Mr. Brock. Hey, yeah, I'll get started in the morning. Oh, good morning? Well, that's hours from now. You better start at once, Sheriff. In the dark? Well, I think it gets light about 5 o'clock. You should find your way around by then. Oh, 5 o'clock. You know, I, I better get my stuff together. Your stuff? Oh, yeah, my, my, uh, my guns, my handcuffs, oh, of course. my warrants. Oh. Well, good luck, Sheriff. Yeah, well, thanks, Mr. Brock. I'm, I'm going to make it all up to you. That kid couldn't find a needle in a pincushion. I tell you, Brock... All right, Mayor, all right. I just want him out of town. He's liable to get himself killed hanging around here. And I want this clean, and I want it simple. What about Sylvia Ann? Where's she gone? Will you get a hold on yourself? She's a woman, isn't she? She's worried about this business. She doesn't want to see it happen. She'll be back when it's all over. Everything's getting all mixed up. Maybe we could call it off, huh? We can call it off. Do you understand that? And stop worrying about Sylvie Ann. I told you she'll be back. She loves me. Yes, uh, I'm all right. Is this a ponderosa? Oh, yes, if it is. What are you doing with little Jill's horse? I've got to talk to Mr. Cartwright. I best get you in the house. Paul! Hey, Paul! Come down here, quick! What is it, horse? Paul, this, this little gal came riding in on little Joe's horse. Get some brandy. What's this about you riding in on my son's horse? Well, I... I thought if I rode his horse, you'd believe me. Believe what? Who are you? Where are you from? My name is Sylvia Ann. Thanks. <coughs> My father owns the Palace Hotel in Rubicon, and I work there. You didn't ride all the way from Rubicon to tell me that. What's happened to little Joe? Well, nothing yet, but something's going to unless he gets some help. What kind of trouble is he in? Mr. Cartwright, you brought him up too well. You, you taught him about responsibility. What kind of trouble is he in? He's in serious trouble. And in a few hours, he's going to be facing up to it all alone. Facing up to what? Two hired killers. Get at him. You're the girl Joseph has been seeing in Rubicon? I'm the girl. Not quite the right kind of girl for him, am I, Mr. Cartwright? You're a pretty girl, Sylvia. The important thing is to get help to Joseph right now. Doesn't everybody ever go to bed around here? Oh, why didn't you say we had company? It's, it's Joe. Hey, he's in trouble in Rubicon. Saddle up the horses. It's a long ride. Will you be able to ride with us? I can try.
And so, Dad, I realize now it's awfully tough to face responsibility alone. But I've made up my mind to see it through. If something goes wrong, I know you'll understand. Joe. like a charm. The rest is up to you. That's what we've been paid for, isn't it? Now remember, it's the man I shake hands with. that shotgun. All right, everybody out. I'm gonna get a doctor. Mr. Jennings? You know this man, his name is Brock. His name isn't Brock. It's Winslow, John Winslow. I saw him commit murder in St. Louis six years ago. For your sake. Poor Sylvia. Always the warrior. Looks like you're six years too late. I don't understand. Jennings can tell you. That's why I was meeting you. To wipe you and that memory out of... out of the world. Well, that was almost mine. Take it easy. I've sent for a doctor. A doctor? Aren't you gonna use that tin badge of yours? Aren't you gonna arrest me? I made a big mistake picking you. I'm sorry, Sylvia. <laughs> Long, my dear.
job, son. It was a lot tougher than I thought it would be. Well, I didn't think you'd mind if we uh, came to pay you a visit. Thanks, it gets a little lonely in a strange town. Looks like you did a real good job, little brother. You coming home with us? As soon as the regular sheriff gets back. Want us to hang around? Why, so you can make some more jokes about me? Sorry, never again. That's for dang sure, little brother. Well, look, uh, why don't you come over to my office and have a cup of coffee? Shove your end over in the line. Well, there's some more of them. That makes the fifth bunch all together. Yeah. Let's go talk to them. My name is Ben Cartwright. The young man behind me is my son, Joseph. I'm Mike Sullivan. And the boy behind me is my nephew, Bobby Jacks. The kid is Eddie Wheeler. He told me you were coming. Oh, yes. Then you know all about me and why I'm here. The kid says you're going to claim that I'm building on your property. Well... I suppose you have a deed for this land? All signed, legal and proper, by the man who sold it to us, John Polk. Mr. Sullivan, I don't like to tell you this, but the man who signed that deed had no right to sell you the land. It wasn't his to sell. You've been swindled. Mr. Polk told us that you'd be coming around claiming something like that. Oh? If it's his word against yours, we're obliged to take his. Then I'm afraid we're in for a little trouble. Will you try putting us off this land and you'll find out what trouble is? Put that rifle down, there'll be no shooting. What about him? Joseph! Now, Mr. Sullivan, I was hoping you'd be a reasonable man. I brought these people a long, hard ways to get here. We fought hunger and thirst, and disease and Indians and thieves. We did it all to get a little land that we could settle on. I am a reasonable man, Mr. Cartwright. But I'm not a weak one. I'm not a coward. I'll fight for what belongs to me. If need be, I'll kill you. So will I, Mr. Sullivan. So will I. Deceiving me. Oh, your eyes are all right, Pa. I see it too. I'm Amanda Gates, and this is Victoria, my sister. I do. We're unmarried ladies. When we bought this place, the man told us that ranchers would want to water their stock here. Now it's perfectly all right for a small fee, of course. 
Well, there must be some mistake. Why do you say that? Well, ma'am, this, this land and, 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 and the water, they, they belong to the Ponderosa. And we haven't sold any of it. Well, excuse me, my name is Ben Cartwright. This is my son, Joseph. We know you, Ben Cartwright, you black-hearted scoundrel. Well, ma'am, there's, there's no need for rifles. Our people are settling this valley to the mountains on land legally bought and paid for. No bandit named Cartwright's going to run us off. Huh? Why don't you just be a, a cowardly man that named Cartwright and just get out of here before that thing goes off? No, I... I, 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 I uh, Paul, why don't you come with me? My name is Henri Belrose. Oh, my name's Ben Cartwright. It's my son, Joseph. Joseph. How are you? This is my friend, Jean Wheeler. Well, just how many are you? And how did you all happen to come here? We came here on a wagon train. My wife and I, we came to this country to build a home. Mr. Belrose, this happens to be my land. It is my land, Mr. Cartwright. Do you wish to see the deed? Yes, I would very much like to see the deed. Lisette. Please bring our deed and come out and meet Mr. Cartwright. My wife, Lisette. This is Mr. Cartwright and his son, Joseph. Mr. Rose? How are you, ma'am? Well, you, you came all the way by wagon train with this infant? <laughs> she came only part of the way. She was born on the trail. That's why we are so happy to be here in our new home. Seal. Does the deed look all right to you, Mr. Cartwright? Best looking deed I've ever seen. Well, we'll talk again, Mr. Belrose. Yeah. Really? Goodbye. Good day, ma'am. Hopsin, <clears throat> get me a decent piece of soap. I can't wash myself with this sliver. Hopsin! This water's getting cold. You want me to catch me dead? I'm saying. I'm saying, put a little more wood on that fire. Why aren't these tiles warming to the fire? Good heavens, man, be some be efficient for heaven's sake. All right. Now the hot water to rinse me. I'm the double boy. Now, hold on, hold on. That's not too hot, is it? No, sir, Colonel Bright. Not hot. Not hot at all. Oh. Ice water! Ice water! You fiend! That was deliberate! Where are you going, you monster? Take long trip for help. Maybe go back China. <laughs> Kip? Well, I wouldn't exactly like to wrestle a bear about now. Well, about all we got to do tomorrow is go up and bring in those strays. Well, don't make it easy on my account. I hired out to work. Well, for a new hand, you're doing fine. Hey, will you look at that? Any man who sneaks away from danger is a deserter. In any army in the world, he'd be put against a wall and shot. I'm no deserter, Mr. Adam. I take long vacation. Colonel Bragg, all time yell. Head go boom, boom, boom. Very bad. Pa served with the Colonel. Old Fust and Fuddle, as men called him. Pa even saved the Colonel's life one night when he wandered into the enemy lines. I know. He tell me same story 50 times. Well, that makes it a privilege to have him as a guest in our house, to keep his valuables in our safe, and to look after his busted leg. 
No privilege, Mr. Adam. Just too much dad burn trouble. Now, look, Hopsing, it's not just a privilege. You see, the horse the colonel fell from when he busted his leg was one that Pa sold him. Now, that makes it an obligation. Hopsing, obligation? Well, you're one of the family, aren't you? Just like me, Hoss, and little Joe. You too smart for me, Mr. Adam. You say I one of the family, I cannot go. I stay. Benjamin, I still say you're avoiding the main issue. And that's a... That's an easy thing to do when the duty is an unpleasant one. What do you consider the main issue, Colonel? These people are trespassers. That's the main issue. No matter what they say, no matter what rights they claim, they're trespassers. And you've got to treat them as such. Well, how do you go about doing that? Remember your military training. Assemble your facts. Make your decision and then proceed with vigor. You order these people off your land, Benjamin. If they refuse, call out your hands, mount, ride and drive them off. Well, these people don't think they're trespassers. They think they own the land. And with every reason, they paid for it with every penny they had. They're trespassers. They're stealing your land. Thieves! No, Colonel. The man who sold them land that wasn't his to sell, he's the thief. These people are victims. Victims. I tell you, they're thieves. I kind of go along with Paul. What about you, Adam? Victims. Yeah, these people aren't thieves, Colonel. They just trusted the wrong man, that's all. You're being sentimental, soft, weak. You can't take the troubles of every man alive onto yourself. These are tough, vibrant people. They fought to get this far, and they'll fight to stay. Then fight. Some of them would be killed. You've got a right to protect your land. If they force you to it, your hands are clean. Some of us would be killed. What comfort clean hands then? There's risk from the day a man's born. True. But I'm not going to add to that risk. I'm not going to turn this into a range war. We'll proceed legally. I'll see my lawyer. Meanwhile, if we can find their money and give it back to them, the settlers might be more inclined to listen to reason. Adam, tomorrow morning, why don't you ride into Virginia City? Let the sheriff know what's been happening. Well, I was going with Kip up to the uh, North Range to look for strays. But I guess he can go along. Oh, he should be able to. He's a good man. Joe, the last we heard of this man, Polk, he was in Carson City. Maybe you can cut his trail there and follow it. Right, Pa. I wonder if we should really see the settlers and try to get a line on Polk. Hoss, why don't you do that? Yes, sir. Start on your land first. Well, my land? Yeah, Hoss, haven't. Why, them dirty, no good for nothing. Uh, uh, uh. You ought to see your guests first before you use such language. Uh, and I wouldn't give me a right name. Don't shoot anybody named Cartwright just like that. country loaded with deer, you sure go a long ways and never see one. Move to the high mountains is my guess. You think we get a shot at least? But no, not the best part of three hours. Ah, shut your whining. I'm so hungry I could eat a boot. What are you doing? That's a steer. Well, that's food. Must be a ponderosa stray. Well, this lava will be the only food we'll get for a couple of days. See for yourself. We just shot a steer. We're getting ready to skin it out and butcher it. That's Ponderosa Beach. You've got no right to it. A hungry man's got a right to the closest food, boy. If you're hungry, you can buy a beef or you can ride in and ask for it. But you kill a steer out here on the range and it's the same as stealing it. Don't call us thieves. I don't know what else to call you. There's a dead beef and it doesn't belong to you. What are you going to do? I'm going to go back to the ranch and tell the card rights exactly what I found out here. I don't know what they're going to do about it, but I've seen men hang for less. You don't hang me. Oh, you blasted fool!
Uncle Mike, I had to kill him. You want me to hang for a steer? Ah, no one was gonna hang you. That was talk. Now, our fight for land has turned into a fight to stay alive. Howdy, ladies. I was just riding by, and I thought I'd stop in and say, Howdy. Uh, whereabouts is your menfolk at? We have no menfolk. We're unmarried ladies. Who might you be? Oh, my name is Hoss Jones. Yeah, that's my name, Hoss Jones. What do you want? Well, my Paul, what I mean to say is, uh, well, I was so nearby, I thought maybe I'd stop in and see if there was something a, a man could do. That depends on the man. Do you know a Ben Cartwright? Oh, yes, ma'am. It seems to me like I have heard that name. Worst black-hearted scoundrel alive. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid right now I got to agree with you, ma'am. Just a little bit. We were warned about him by Mr. Polk. Who's he? Why, the nice gentleman that sold us this place. Such a fine man. Except for that one thing. Yes. Do you smoke, young man? Oh, no, ma'am. I chew a little bit every once in a while. Ugh! Such a nice man. How could he smoke those big, nasty things, all twisty? Yeah, it's disgusting, ain't it, ma'am? A woman can always tell a gentleman. Doesn't your wife say that, Mr. Jones? Oh. No wife, ma'am. Then you can help us with those big logs. It's so nice to have a man around. Especially a single man. <laughs> All in through there. And they've got plat maps as well as deeds to the property, huh? Well, the plats aren't very accurate, but they're close enough. This fellow Polk, he must have known the Tucker Creek side of the Ponderosa pretty well. He knew enough that we didn't get over there very much. How long you figured they've been in there? Two weeks, going on three. How many families of them? Well, there's six different outfits, 300 acres apiece. And they all paid their last dollar for worthless claims. I don't like it, Adam. A man will really fight to hang on to what his last dollar's bought from. Some will kill. Well, that's all I need. I'll get on the telegraph right away to Sacramento and San Francisco, and I'll get back to you just as soon as I hear anything. Thanks, Roy. Bye. Bye. Uh, he's a big man, uh, 55 or 60, an average kind of a man. Uh, John Polk was his name. He had a beard and... Uh, uh, anything else? He had a wife, too. Good-looking woman. Looked to be much younger than he was, but stunning, though. Yeah. And they stayed here? Oh, yes, 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 indeed. They had our best suite, as a matter of fact. Mrs. Polk was a very good-looking woman. Yeah, so you said. Uh, did they leave any forwarding address of any kind? No, no, they didn't. Look, well, do you have any idea at all where they went? No, I haven't. Is there anybody in Carson City who might have an idea? No, I'm positive there's not. So why positive? Well, well, many people would like to find him. He left owing a thousand dollars in debts around town. I'd say the man was a crook. I think his wife was, too. But she was a lovely woman. Absolutely stunning. Yeah, yeah, so you said. Now look, is there anything else in particular you can remember about this man, Polk? Oh, yes. 
Yes, as a matter of fact, there was. He always struck his matches across the posterior. He what? He smoked cigars. He, uh, he always lit his matches like this. His wife didn't like it much, though. Uh, didn't like what? The gesture. Uh, uh, this. Oh, but she was a... Stunning woman. Thank you very much. Benjamin? Colonel, I thought you were napping. Are you going into Virginia City today? Well, yes, Colonel, I am. I'm going to see our lawyer. Anything you wanted? Well, I thought you might ask the doctor to come out. I, I'd like to get this splint off this leg. I, I've been a prisoner long enough. Well, really, Colonel, our guests don't usually refer to themselves as prisoners. Well, I didn't mean it that way, Benjamin. <laughs> I, of course you didn't. It's just that I ought to be on my way. Well, I know it's hard for an active man to be tied down, but I can promise you Doc Martin won't let you get out of that splint for a while yet, so you best grit your teeth and enjoy your rest. You didn't think I'd become a fixture in your home after you saved my life ten years ago, did you? I'm sure someone else would have come along to save your life, Colonel. I'm still beholden to you. I sold you the horse that threw you when you broke your leg, so I suppose I'm beholden to you. Nonsense. I fell off that horse. Well, go along, Benjamin. I'll be all right. Of course you will be. <laughs> Mr. Ben. Mr. Ben, where you go? I'm going to Virginia City. Do you need something? I am afraid for boy Kip Taylor. His horse come back without him. <laughs> I'll go by the North Range and check. I'll take his horse with me. Who is he? One of my hands. What do you know about this boy? Nothing, Mr. Cartwright. Like you, I just seen it. You see what happened? Somebody was butchering a steer, looks like. Yeah. Ponderosa's steer. It looks to me like Kip Taylor caught him at it. And he just killed him and left him here. Why were you following me, boy? My folks thought it'd be best to know what you was up to. They was afraid what you might do if you got men together. I was going to let them know. Well, you can let them know something for me now. You can tell them I want them to gather at the Belrose place. You can tell them I'll meet them there. You can say that I'll be riding in with only one man. This one. <laughs>
Across that saddle lies the body of one of my men. He found someone butchering a ponderosa beef and that someone, whoever it was, shot him down. I don't know who it was that shot him down. It could have been a stranger who rode on out of the country after the killing was done. It could be. It could also be the killer is one of you. If the killer is one of you, it'd be best if you found him out and turn him over to the law before all of you are blamed. Thanks for the advice, Mr. Cartwright. It's good advice. Kip Taylor's relatives and friends might want an eye for an eye. And you're strangers here. What started out as a dispute over land could turn with this into a shooting war, with more dead to bury on both sides. Oh, what about our land? You can all stay here for a while. All I ask is that you don't build and don't cut trees, and don't break sod. We don't want your charity. We want to build, and cut, and dig, here, on this land, land we paid for, our land. You think about all this. Talk among yourselves. Decide what you want to do. And remember, I'll help you follow any sensible course. But if you fight me, I'll have to fight you. Side. There's nothing to decide. We've got to fight him now. But why? Why must we fight? To survive. It doesn't matter now who killed that man. It doesn't matter now who has the best claim to this land. All that matters now is root hog or die. We came a long way, Ori and I, to get away from violence. We don't want killing. We'll move on. Move on to where? You've got no money to buy more land here. You can't go on to free land. Your animals and your gear are beat out. The season's gone. The passes are full of snow. It's this place or nothing. But there is a right and a wrong to choose between. Not for you, Belrose. And not for you, Wheeler, and not for any of us. Men with several choices can fret between what's right and what's wrong. But when there's only one thing you can do to stay alive, you've got to call that one thing right and go ahead with it. Is anyone home? Hello, Emir. Hello, the house. Hello, Emir. Is there anyone home? Who are you? What do you want? My name is Bell Rose. I must talk to Mr. Cartwright. He isn't here. Come back some other time. But it's quite important. I would like to wait. You come back. The settlers are in an ugly mood. They are ready to fight. I think Mr. Cartwright should know. I told you to come back. Now you're going to have to do what I tell you. I know you. Yes, of course, I know you. The beard is gone. But you are the man that...
Yes, of course. Have my boys come back yet? I'm all alone. What in the world's wrong? That Tim Bellrose, one of the settlers, he's dead. I just found his body in a wagon about a quarter of a mile from here. And I've just taken Kip Taylor's body to his parents in Virginia City. Taylor dead? Murdered. My boys aren't back yet, eh? No. There's been no one here. Even Hop Singer's off somewhere. I've been alone all morning. Why are you staring at me like that? Huh? Oh, I, I wasn't staring. It was... Bellrose has a wife and a baby. I'm going to have to take his body back to his widow. But when my sons get back here, tell them that I want them to stay here. Shouldn't they be with you? No. If they were with me, someone might think that I was out for more killing. And I'm not. <laughs> Tragic news, Mrs. Bellrose. Your husband lies dead in that wagon. I know. Eddie came to tell me. I found him in the wagon about a quarter of a mile from my house. I don't know how he got killed, and I don't know who killed him. He was going to your place. He didn't want killing. He hoped you would know how to stop it. He was going to my house? And now he lies dead. Mrs. Belrose, I'll, I'll be back and we'll talk again of this. But for the moment, please accept my deepest sympathies for yourself and the child. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. to fight to stay alive, and I'll tell you the fight's already begun. We don't know who killed Bellrose, and we don't know who killed the ranch hand. I do. My nephew, Jacks here killed Cartwright's ranch hand. Jacks killed him? Why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you turn him in? He's my sister's boy, and I'm sworn to keep him safe. Besides, he didn't kill him out of meanness. He was scared into it. You know how he is. I know it. Killed that Indian crossing the plains, being scared. That darn near got us all killed. I didn't turn him over to the Indians then, and I'm not turning him over now. Same as then, this is a finished fight and we need everybody. We've got to let them know we don't scare easy. Then they'll leave us alone. Then they'll leave us have our land. The fight goes to him who hits first and hardest. Oh, are you all right? Colonel, tell us all about it. Yeah, I'm all right. Did you find out anything new? Bits and pieces, nothing definite. Colonel? 
Now, are you sure there was no one here all day? No, there was no one here. And there was no one moving around outside? Well, I don't know about that. I haven't been outside. I've been sitting here all day. And you didn't go outside yourself? I just told you I didn't. Colonel, there's mud on your sock. Well, I, I may have gone outside for a moment for a breath of air. I, I can't be expected to. Desk clerk told me Polk used to light his cigars by striking a match in his trousers. Those spinster ladies, they, they told me about his cigars, too. Black and twisted. Then you weren't alone today, were you? Comrade in arms, old friend, guest in my house. And now you know how low a man can sink. Belrose came here to see me and recognized you as Polk, the man who sold him our land. Isn't that right, Colonel? That's right. And you killed him. And I killed him. The young wife, beautiful, greedy, spent all I had on her, went head over heels in debt. An old man making a fool of himself over a young woman. It isn't a new story, is it? No, it isn't a new story. But it's just what you might have expected of old fussed and fuddled, isn't it? Oh, I knew what the men thought of me, Benjamin. Not that I could blame them. Never did anything right in my life. Got lost in the woods at night, fell off horses. Not a man, a fool. Not a soldier, a clown. No, she's gone too. When she found out that I'd broken this leg, she thought I'd botched the whole deal on her. Ran off with another man. I thought I could get away with swindling these settlers. I'd take the money and you'd send them packing and that's all there would be to it. I didn't think there would be any killing. Where's the money, Colonel? In the small satchel in your study. Every dollar of it. Boys, hitch up a wagon. The colonel and I are going to return that money. And saddle up your horses. Be right along with us. I wouldn't want anyone getting the idea of hanging the colonel without a trial. I didn't want to kill him, Benjamin, but he recognized me. You can't put a bullet back in a gun once it's been fired. You can't give a father back to his child once her father's been buried. But you can pay back part of the debt by returning this money and by facing up to the law for what you've done. So we'd better get going, Colonel. No, Benjamin. Nobody's going to hang me. Trial or no trial. You stand in my way and I'll kill you. What's become of you, Jonathan? I warned you, Benjamin. Don't stand in my way. You'd pull that trigger? Don't try me, old friend. I hate you. You hate me? You've always been the better man, haven't you, Ben? You've always had the success and I've had the failure. You had the money and the land and the family and I had nothing. You even took over my command when I was relieved. I was following orders, Colonel. You knew that. For incompetence. I was relieved for incompetence, old comrade in arms. You knew that. Now I'm going to give the orders and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to take that money and I'm going to take your buckboard and I'm getting out of here. And if any of your boys stand in my way, there's going to be one or more of them dead. All right, Colonel. There's your money. My boys are hitching up the buckboard. You can start running. But first, you'll have to kill me. And will this money change what you are? Will killing me give you the courage you lack? As if you think it will. You'd better pull that trigger. It isn't me you've hated all this time, is it, Colonel? It's you, yourself. 
No matter how fast you run or where you hide, sooner or later, you're going to have to face the truth and live with yourself. This way. Now, they're a weaker party than we are, and we got surprise on our side. I'll have no part of a massacre, Sullivan. Will you fight? They give us no choice, but I gotta see it's fight or die before I shoot. You'll see. <laughs> now take the horses around back and take cover. I'll do the talking. <laughs> Judgment Day, Cartwright. Here and now is where we get things settled. You're not going to settle anything this way. Look around you. There's no need for this. No need for any ambush. That'll depend upon you. We want clear title to our land. The land is not yours. You're getting your money back. The money will do us no good. We haven't got time to wait for it. You don't have to wait for your money. I'm the man that called himself John Pope. Sit down, the money's sit down. here. Oh, fool, do you want and I to... kill Belrose. I'll stand trial for it. Give us the man who killed Kip Taylor and the fight is ended. The fight is done. Jack's there is the man who killed Kip Taylor. <laughs> Put the bullet back, but I, I stopped one. I finally did something right. Done with killing? Yes, we are. We'd be obliged to have our money back. But we'd rather you kept the money and let us keep the land. Sullivan, I can't do that. We've got this land staked out for other purposes. Would you be willing to take some land on the other side of the Ponderosa? We would, if we could pay the price. Well, I figure you... You could have killed my three sons and me. I guess you paid the price. Might have proud to have his neighbors. Thank you, officer. 
Ain't that burn? I'm glad you didn't catch that slow boat to China. <laughs> uh, thank you, I'm saying. Hey, I got the winner. Well, I guess you'll be playing me then. The game's not over yet. Oh, did you deliver that lumber to the settlers? Yeah, wagon load to each place. Good. It's going to be the difference in them folks being warm and comfortable this winter and freezing to death, then. Mm hmm. Hey, Horace, how'd you make out with those school marm ladies? Uh, I understand one of them almost hogtied you. Me? <laughs> I know how to handle them female women. You just told them that I was a bachelor and I was going to stay a bachelor and there wasn't a dead burn thing they could do about it. I told them I'd promise my dear old daddy I was going to stay single. Oh, is that what you promised them? Hey, Horace, you know, I didn't realize you knew so much about women. Huh. Joe, it's easy. You just got to know how to handle them. Mm. I've learned that females is pretty much the same in the world over, whether they're a horse or a woman. You just got to be firm with them. Tell them what you want them to do in no uncertain terms, and by golly, they'll do it. Mm. Oh, hey. Well, ladies, and what brings you here? Oh, well, we were just passing by and thought we'd drop in for a minute. Well, believe me, it's our pleasure. We're having a little box social tonight, and we wondered if we could persuade Mr. Hoss to attend. Well, I, uh, I think if you would ask him in no uncertain terms, it, uh, by golly, I, I think he'd do it. Anything else I can help you with, Mrs. Banning? No, thank you very much. Mrs. Banning? I'm Ben Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright. How good of you to extend your hospitality to a poor sick stranger. Well, really, the wife of Horace Banning is hardly a stranger. What a very nice thing for you to say. <laughs> oh, this is my daughter, Melinda. Coachman, it's been a delightful experience. Thank you, ma'am. Might I suggest that in the future you try to keep your carriage a little bit cleaner? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mrs. Banning, my buckboard is right over there. I, I hope you won't find that one too dusty. Oh, I feel sure that your conveyance will be more than satisfactory, Mr. Cartwright. Come along, Melinda. This is where the Ponderosa begins. Why, well, this is the domain of an emperor. Well, how do you like it, Melinda? It's so different from home. It's like being in another world. Well, we want you both to feel that this is your home, and we want you both to stay as long as you possibly can, or at least as long as Horace can bear to be without you. Well, you do make us feel most welcome, Benjamin. I wish Daddy were here. So do I, darling. So do I. It is too bad that he couldn't have come up with this. But publishing a daily newspaper is quite a job. You know, it must be about 25 years since I've seen Horace. But even in those days, I, I knew he'd be a success. Mm -hmm.
Banning, your daughter, my boys, Hoss, little Joe. Well, how wonderful it is to meet both of you. My, they're striking specimens, Benjamin. Must be your fine Ponderosa air here. Aren't they handsome, Melinda? Yes, very. Oh, thank you very much, ma'am. Welcome to the Ponderosa. We heard you was coming, Miss Banning. Pa told us you're in kind of bad health. I hope the Ponderosa and your stay here will make you feel better. Well, thank you very much, horse. It's nothing serious, really. I'm just overtired. I want to see the horses. Uh, come with me. I read about that once. I never dreamed I'd ever see a bucking bronco. Now have a good look. It looks so dangerous. We have to do it every day. He's quite a daredevil. That's my older brother Adam. He's a darn good horsebreaker. Horse looks like it's half wild. Well, he was all wild once. It's hard to think of horses as being wild. Where I come from, they're, they're all so gentle. Well, you gotta break them, and they won't do any work for you. What is it that has to be broken, little Joe? Uh, it's just, uh, just the wildness that's in them. Well, this is my brother, Adam. Adam, this is our guest, Melinda Banning. Good uh, morning, Melinda. Welcome to the Ponderosa. I'm afraid we're gonna have to excuse him for a minute. It's time for you to go to work, buddy. They got a little old horse over there all ready for you. Oh! Oh! Stay right here. I'll be back. Adam? Yeah? That was so exciting. It looked so very dangerous. It's just a job. Watch him. All right, turn him out! That horse will kill him! Well, it hasn't happened to him yet. Stop bucking now. Does that mean he's broken? I know, but most of the fight's out of him. Oh. Oh. Great joke. Just great. Oh, you're not so bad yourself, brother. All you need is a little practice. What'd you think of the ride? I don't know how you do it. He doesn't either. Thanks a lot. Well, you see, it didn't hurt the horse, and now it'll be useful. No longer free to do what he wants, but useful. Melinda, come along. I must say, I find myself a bit surprised at these Cartwrights. For all their money, they live out here like so many savages. Of course, that could be improved. And they are of good family. A bit uncouth, perhaps, but there's good blood there. There is. And their holdings. They're as vast as half the state of Maryland. Mother? And what you could do with this place. 
I can see it, the servants, the butlers, the footmen. Mother, may I say something? No, darling, not in that tone of voice. That always means that you're about to think for yourself. Anyhow, we said everything there was to be said before we ever left Baltimore. But, Mother, please, just listen to me for a moment. <laughs> yes, Mother. Linda. Are you sure? Are you quite sure that what we're doing is right? Don't you know? In your heart, don't you know? That what I'm doing is for your own good. Hmm? Mother. Come on now. Get out of that tub and get dressed. Mother, please, please listen to me. Melinda, there is nothing sadder, more futile than foolishness. And you, my poor darling, seem to have been blessed with more than your portion, thanks to your father. But you're lucky, because to compensate, you have beauty. Beauty that was wasted in Baltimore, thanks to the way we had to live due to your father's continuous failures. But out here, here in Ponderosa, we're making that beauty work for us. Mother, that isn't what I wanted to know. I know all that. I wanted you to tell me that what we're doing isn't wrong. Wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. Everything that we're doing is right. Happiness for you is right. Security for you is right. Security for your children. Nothing. Everything that we are doing is right. It's all right. How could I be anything but right? Wanting all of this for you? Melinda? Baby, I have fought for your happiness from the day that you were born. But I'm getting tired. I really am. I'm awfully tired. There isn't a great deal of fight left in me. Selfishly, I've even been hoping that somewhere in your future there might be a little peace, a little satisfaction for me, too. Ruin those wonderful eyes. You are a lovely girl. I merely want someone to appreciate that. Come on, let's get dressed. That was a delicious meal, Benjamin. Really delicious. Well, thank you. We, uh, I'm so pleased that you enjoyed your first meal at the Ponderosa. I enjoyed it all thoroughly. Miss Melinda, you ain't tasted nothing yet. You taste some Hob Singh's Hong Kong mulligan. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Baltimore is noted for its food, especially seafood. Uh, we catch some pretty fine trout around here, too. Chinka tea oysters lying on a bed of glistening ice and lobsters, first broiled and then served in melted butter. And our home, brilliantly lit with hundreds of candles in crystal chandeliers, and in one part of the room, a small orchestra playing gently and softly. Very often, the music by that gifted young Polish composer, Mr. Chopin. And the servants, one behind each place, in the white uniforms, the white cotton gloves, the white stockings. <laughs> And inevitably, the governor is the first one to arrive. He's always so prompt. But then he has great respect for my husband and Horace. Poor dear, dear Horace. How he fusses about the social life I impose upon him. But I think deep down he enjoys it just as much as I do. I'm afraid he'd be rather disappointed in our primitive way of life out here. Oh, no, 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 not at all. You're wrong about that. Horace is a great out-of-doors man. You'd all like him so much. But do you know, his idea of a banquet is a hunt breakfast after an early morning exciting ride to the hounds. He has his own stables. Most of them are thoroughbreds. I feel a little faint. I, I need some air. I think it was all the traveling today. Oh, no, no, gentlemen, please sit down. Melinda's given to these momentary spells. Poor darling, she's been so delicately born and so delicately bred. I think I better see that she's all right. Excuse me. Well, 
Linda, you all right? I'm fine, little Joe. You shouldn't have left the others. I, I saw that way you looked. It worried me. You're nice, little Joe. Hey, you know, you don't talk much. Your mother seems to do it for both of you. She's much wiser than I am. Yeah. You know, the things she was talking about, I've only read about them in books. Must be a lot different for you out here. I like it here. We like having you here. It's such a, a wonderful feeling of feeling a family. <laughs> yeah, I know. Pa talks about that all the time, the family. That's how everybody thinks of us around here, the Cartwright family. You don't have to be here long to realize you all belong together. Hey, you know, sometimes I think we're together too much. That's a little rough on me, being the youngest. Well, here I am talking about myself, and it's really you I want to talk about. There isn't very much to know. Where I come from, I lead a very quiet life. Quiet? Well, with that house and all those servants and the, the governor coming to dinner all the time? Your father being a big newspaper publisher? I... What's the matter? You feel bad again? It's nothing. I mean, you're not disappointed in the way the way we live out here. Oh, Joe, please. I can't stand these terrible lies anymore. Your awful stories about parties and servants and hunt breakfasts. Until I conceived this idea of bringing you out here, you were irrevocably committed to the kind of life I've had. And nobody knows better than you what that's been. But here, out here, I've created a new image for you. You have glamour and distinction and mystery. And you mustn't do anything to alter that, darling. Not until after you and Joseph are married. Then it won't matter. Why must it be little Joe? Because Horst doesn't feel that way about you. And Adam is far too cunning. I watched him at dinner tonight. He'd be too difficult to control. Suppose I don't love little Joe. That doesn't matter. Marriage is a contract. No contract can be executed under the influence of emotion. I suppose you're right. Of course I'm right. You'll have a perfect marriage with Joseph. You'll be able to twist him around your little finger. Just think. You'll have everything your own way. Just think how happy you will be. You've been twisting my father around your little finger for 25 years. Has it made you happy? Who in the whole world could be happy with your father? For you, Melinda, it's going to be different. So different. And I ask you with all my heart to believe me when I say everything I'm doing, I am doing for you. Wonderful. Hey, that's just wonderful. What is it? Well, the recipe's been in my family for generations. It comes from France. Do you have any wine? Well, it's a little early in the morning for that, isn't it? Not for me, silly. For the stew. I told you this recipe came from France. Well, I, uh... I don't think we have any wine around here. <clears throat> if you think real hard, it'll come to you. It's in the pantry. Oh, yeah, the, the pantry. Yeah, for, for the minister, I forgot. I knew it would come to you. Well, I'll get it. I haven't seen much of you the last few days, Adam. You haven't seen much of anybody except Joe. I've missed you. <laughs> I'll bet you have. No, Adam, believe me. What kind of a woman are you? First it's Joe, and the minute his back is turned, it's me. Adam, if you just let me explain, Adam. 
Yes, Melinda? I was going to ask you if you'd like to taste some of the beef stew. No, I'd rather be surprised. He's going to be surprised, all right. Wine and beef stew. What are the Frenchmen going to think of next? I like it better here at night. I can't see how big the country is. I guess you must be getting pretty lonesome for home. I suppose I am. Not the way it sounds. It's, it's just that I'm, I'm used to it back there. You think you could ever get used to the way it is out here? You get used to love, little Joe, and then you don't have to get used to anything else. Does that mean what I want it to mean? You're sweet, little Joe. You're the nicest person I've ever met. I mean, you're pretty sweet yourself. I haven't been able to think of much else since you got here. Then I'm glad I came. But I'd like to ask you a question if I... if I thought you'd give me an answer now. What answer do you want, little Joe? is invigorating, isn't it? It's like fine perfume. Mother, the men may not like it, bothering them while they work. Joseph asked you to come, did he not? Yes, Mother. Men adore women who show an interest in their work. It makes them so proud of their little achievements. Mother, there's something I must tell you. Please, Melinda, I have ordered you not to think. <laughs> Benjamin! Well, I, uh... I got these side saddles. I hope they're what you're used to. Benjamin, you don't think the boys would mind if we looked in on their work for a while, do you? Mind? Why, not at all. I, as a matter of fact, I think you'd find the work we do in the Ponderosa very interesting. Now, you won't forget where they are. They're just over that next rise. Mm. Uh, shall I help you up? Oh, would you please? Oh, boy. I wonder who asked them out here. Well, I did. Any reason why I shouldn't? They're our guests, Adam. Hi, right, Melinda. You have a good ride? Hunt it round. You enjoy yourself? I should say we did. Thank you so much. Oh, there we are. That was just fine. Just fine. Well... Are you cooking? <laughs> no, ma'am, we're not. You don't seem very glad to see us, Adam. No, I was just thinking about your comfort. This might be a little rough on you. Thank you very much, Adam. But you'll find that Melinda can accustom herself to anything that happens on a ranch. Sure. Oh, let's get the cab, will you? Joe, get some more wood. Right, Adam. Excuse me. to burn that tiny thing. All cattle look alike. It's the only way we have of putting our name on them. Besides, it's not really as bad as it looks. You got it?
it happened to him? I told you the women shouldn't be here. Now, why don't you just go back to the house? Adam, you don't have to talk to her that way. All right, the girl's sick. Why don't you take her home? I'll take her home, but only because she's sick. Come on. I'm sorry. I guess it threw me seeing her keel over that way. I'm sorry, Melinda. Looks like little Joe's sort of stuck on that girl, don't it? Yeah. Now, let's get back to work. Yeah. Just remember, we all got to live here together, Adam. Yeah. Get out of the cab, will you? wire is that? Barbed. It's full of sharp points. Experience. That's the best way to learn. But it's so cruel. Well, it goes along with everything else here. Breaking horses, branding calves. Everything's done with pain. You don't have a patent on hurt. Melinda, you are a guest here and you're free to come and go as you please. But it is a working ranch and at the moment I'm pretty busy. led me to do that. Adam, what are you doing? Nothing, Joe, nothing. What do you mean you're doing nothing? Oh, come on. Joe, what do you mean, wait a minute, that's the girl I'm gonna marry. I'm gonna marry? It happened last night, I wanted to tell you when we were all together. Oh, wait a minute, now, didn't this happen awful sudden like I mean... Joe, are you are you sure you love her? More than anything in the world. So when I saw her oh, with wait, Adam... Wait a minute now, Joe. Adam didn't know how you felt about Melinda. No, well, none of us did. I suppose you're right. So I think I'd better set him straight. Now, wait, wait, Joe. Joe, look, uh, you go up to the house. Please, go up to the house. Yes, sir. dress tangle on the wire and I helped her that's all did you know that Joe wants to marry her you're kidding no he just told me when did all this happen well evidently last night well it can never be she's not in love with him what do you mean she's not in love with him look at him do you have any feeling for this girl yourself? No, no, but that's not the point. What is the point? The point is, she kissed me. She kissed me, but she's marrying him. Oh, this is developing into some situation. Well, that's for sure. I think it might be a good idea if I got away for a couple of days. Go down to Tucson, maybe uh, look at that new strain of beef, huh? That might be a good idea. Hard right, if they cost? Yeah, sure, sure. What's going to happen if Joe marries her and then finds out that she doesn't love him?
Chris. Surprise, Deborah, surprise. What in heaven's name are you doing here? Hello, Deborah. Horace. I asked you a question. What are you doing here? Well, my dear, I'm afraid I have some unfortunate news. Some unfortunate news? That means you've lost your job again. Well, that hardly surprises me. Well, why did you come here? Of all times, why did you come here now? But, Deborah, you're here. Where else would I go? Any place, any place in the whole wide world except here. Now, you get on that thing and you ride out of here just twice as fast as you came in. But, Deborah, I don't understand. It's been such a long trip. I'm hungry and I'm tired. Why must I go? Why can't I stay here? Why can't I see Melinda and my old friend, Ben? Because your old friend, Ben, is the last person in the world I want you to see right now. Horace, Melinda and Joseph Cartwright are going to be married. Married? Why, that's just wonderful. Melinda and the son of my old friend. I think that's simply wonderful. Why, it looks like I got here just at the right time. Horace, I have worked for weeks in time and in effort to bring this marriage about. And now you come along unexpectedly and spoil everything. Spoil everything? How could I do that? Why would I do anything to hurt Melinda? I'm her father. You are not Melinda's father. Not a father. You are not the father I have described to Ben Cartwright. But Ben knows me. He knows I'm her father. Ben Cartwright thinks Melinda's father is a successful businessman. He thinks we have lived in grace and splendor. He thinks she has known culture and wealth. I don't know why you made up all those lies, but I know Ben Cartwright. And I know that whether Melinda had money or not wouldn't mean a thing to him if his son loved her. You fool. You dull, thick-headed, idiotic fool. All your life, you've been avoiding reality. Deborah, I don't think that's fair. Well, this is one reality you're not going to avoid. You have been, you have always been, a detriment to your daughter. Deborah. And now you are a threat to her future. If, as you say, you love her, if you really love her, you will get out of here. Don't bring her future happiness crashing down around her head. you too, Daddy. Your mother tells me you're about to get married. Yes, and, and now you can be here for the wedding, too. I was hoping for that. And Mr. Cartwright is going to be so pleased to see you. He talks about you all the time. Let's go see if we can find him. Uh, no, Melinda, I... I'm not going to stay here. You're not going to stay, but where are you going? You just got here. Your mother, she thinks, well, uh, it's better that I go away again. You know, Ben thinks I'm a successful... <laughs> All he need is one look at me and... Yes, I, I see. Your mother's right, you know. Oh, yes, she's right. The only thing important now is you. What happens to you? Mustn't let anything endanger that. No, I, I suppose she's right. Horace, will you please go before they come and find you here? Melinda, I, I haven't been a very good father, I know that, but before I go, just tell me that you love this boy and, and that you'll be happy. She has told you. She's my child, Deborah, just as much as she's yours. Now you get out of here. And if you do anything to interfere with this marriage, I swear by everything that's in me, I will kill you. <laughs> This moment, Deborah, that might be an act of grace. Horace? Horace! My golly, 
what a what a wonderful surprise. Ben, Ben, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Too many years. Isn't Horace. it wonderful, Benjamin? Yes. It's... Now Horace is going to be here for Melinda's wedding, after all. You were the one thing that was lacking, my darling. But now that you're here, everything's going to be all right. Oh, you must be so tired, my sweet. Come along. We'll get you washed up. Come oh, along. We'll, we'll, we'll talk, Horace. I'll get your things. Oh, Joe, did, did you see Melinda's father? I'll tell you, it was the most wonderful surprise when I... Oh, what is it, Joe? It's Melinda. Oh, say, um, what was troubling her? I don't know. She was crying. She said it was all the excitement about seeing her father. Well, of course it was. I guess it was. I'm, I'm probably just imagining things. Well, what else could it have been? I don't know. Just a feeling I have. I love her so much, Pa. You do. She's so beautiful. Well, you've been around pretty girls before. Yeah, but it's not just that. It's, it's everything about her, the way she talks, the clothes she wears, where she comes from. I've just never known a girl like her before. That's why I worry sometimes. I wonder if she can be happy out here. She's so used to the way it was back there. Of course she will be. And I see her cry. I guess I get a little scared. Bob. Good evening, Ben. Nothing like a shave and a bath to make one feel like a new man. Well, I'm glad you're feeling so much better. Will Melinda and Deborah be down shortly? In a little while. You know, women, it takes them longer to comb their hair than it takes a man to grow a beard. <laughs> know exactly what you mean. Well, dinner won't be ready for an hour anyway. Another hour? Mm. Hop Singh wants to outdo himself. Hmm. Well, that'll give us a little time for a talk. Uh, about old times, eh, Ben? I've been looking forward. Well, not, not exactly about old times. I, uh, I'd like to talk to, about your daughter and my son. All right, Ben, how about the happy young couple? That's just the point. Will they be a happy young couple? Why, I don't understand. Deborah assures me this is going to be a perfect marriage. The young people, she says, are very much in love. <sighs> I'm worried about them, Horace. Worried? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's it possible to worry about? Well, for one thing, the backgrounds are so different. Joseph has spent most of his life right here on the Ponderosa. Oh, boys have been back east on visits, certainly, but he's a, he's a boy who's grown up on a ranch. Well, Melinda, well, you know her background better than I do, Horace. You know, the cultural pursuits, the elaborate social life, the elegance of your home. Now, Ben, I, I don't think that's important. It's important to Melinda. If she has to give it all up, for this kind of life. Oh, well, we like it, of course. We, it's what we know. But your daughter... Do you think she loves Joseph enough to want to give up all the wonderful things that you provided her with back east for this kind of life? Life on a ranch? Ben, I, I'm sure Deborah knows what's best. Horace, please. This is not Deborah's decision. It's Melinda's. Ask her. Now, she won't keep the truth from you any more than you would from me. Then there's something... You're right. I won't lie to you. I mean, I wouldn't lie to you. But lies have been told you about... Me and my success, and Belinda and her background. Well? None of it. None of it's true. Nothing. Nothing is further from the truth. I. 
I don't even have a job. Deborah uh, concocted the whole elaborate scheme. Why? Why? Why would you have to do a thing like that? To snare a husband for our daughter. <laughs> but uh, does she have to pretend to be rich? Does she think I'm looking for rich wives for my sons? My wife's ambitious. I guess she's had to be with a failure for her husband. What she did was wrong, Ben. Very wrong. But she did it out of a sincere desire to provide Melinda with a, with a good home, with the kind of life that, that Deborah's always wanted and, and, and never had. That's not the question now, is it? The important thing is... Does Melinda love Joseph? Or would she marry him? For money, for a share of the Ponderosa, the comforts that could be provided to her. I honestly don't know, Ben. All her life, Deborah's been telling her what to like, what to think, what to do. Linda, there's something I must ask you. Yes, Father. I heard you talking to Mr. Cartwright. I know what I must do. Where is little Joe, Mr. Cartwright? Well, he's, he's out of the barn. Uh, his horse went lame. He's tending to him. He's a fine girl, Horace. I'm glad you're both so honest. I'm glad we both finally found the courage. It'd be kind of rough for them out there. Yes, but it'd be better than a lifetime of unhappiness. I'll, uh, I'll tell Deborah. Uh, we'll be leaving for Baltimore in the morning, Ben. Horace, uh, there's no need for you to go back to Baltimore if you don't want to. I have a friend who's a publisher in San Francisco. Could be a fresh start for you. He could use a good man. I'm sorry, Joe. Not only for what my mother and I tried to do, but that we didn't fall in love. I fell in love. No. At least not with me. You fell in love with something my mother created. You can't stay in love with something that never existed. Everything's ready, Mr. Banning. Daddy? Mother? I... I don't know. She's in there with Ben. I'm not sorry for what I did. Not one iota. Well, I can understand that, Deborah. You, with all your money and your empire of the Ponderosa, how could you understand? I didn't inherit the Ponderosa. I worked to build it. But you've never known what it's like to be really poor, to scrimp and pinch and sacrifice to feel ashamed humiliated and even angry at poverty and to swear by all that's holy that the same thing won't happen to your daughter deborah to want the best for your child to fight for it that's a fine thing but to force her into your idea of her future that's wrong 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 for me to want the security and peace of a marriage for my daughter Money can't guarantee that. Only love. Love. Horace and I married for love. Now look at us. I am looking. And I see a lovely young girl who loves her mother so much that she tries to obey her even though it almost breaks her heart. And I see a husband who loves his wife still in spite of the indignities and humiliations she heaps on him. I see two people who love you, and they're waiting for you, outside. I wrote a friend of mine, a publisher in San Francisco. I'm almost certain he'll give Horace a job. It'll be a fresh start for all of you. Go with them. Mm. <laughs> 
Goodbye, Ben. And thank you for everything. Goodbye, Horace. Good luck. Goodbye, Melinda. Goodbye, Mr. Cartwright. And thank you.